Change the Sky by Margaret St. Clair. This story was written under the pseudonym of Idris Seabright. Originally published in the March 1955 issue of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Republished the following year in the number 26 issue of Fiction Magazine and in a French anthology in 1968. Its first appearance in a collection of the author's stories was in Change the Sky and Other Stories in 1974, which was given a French translation and released two years later. The year 2020 saw the release of a complete collection of her stories entitled A Compendium of Margaret St. Clair. Two years later, the story appeared in another anthology called Rediscovery, Science Fiction by Women, Volume 2, which covers the years 1953 through 1957. Read by Daryl T. Smith II for my channel, Quasar Spectra. Change the Sky It would be an expensive world to make, said the artist. He rolled a lump of play putty into a rope, coiled it up on itself, and whacked it down on his drawing board. From what you say, you'd want lots of flowers and women that would come high. It isn't women I want, Pendleton said stiffly and a little wearily. I've been to many worlds with beautiful, willing women. I'm not asking you to make me some sort of lustful paradise. What I'm hunting is a place that's so beautiful, or so winning, or so right, that I'll feel this is the place in the whole universe that I love best. This is home. Um... The artist bounced his putty on the floor a couple of times. Tell me about yourself, he said without looking up. I don't get many clients like you, you know. Most of them are people who aren't physically able to go starside and visit the worlds in person. It's unusual for somebody to come in here who's done much traveling. A shadow crossed Pendleton's face. There was no use in telling the artist, but he himself wouldn't be physically able to go from world to world much longer, hunting the one right place. He'd had deceleration sickness badly in his last birth, when he was purser on the Taiki. Two more trips, and he'd be done for. If he hadn't found what he was looking for by then, it was that knowledge that had brought him into the artist's atelier. I've spent most of my life in space, he said unwillingly. There isn't really much to tell, the artist raised one eyebrow. I doubt that. For example, I gather you're a traveled person. Which one of the various worlds you've visited has seemed to you the most beautiful, or the most appealing, or interesting, and so on? Genlis is the most beautiful by far, Pendleton answered. It's a water world with deep green, swelling, foam-laden seas, and a sky so intensely blue that it's almost purple. On the islands, there are a few islands. Tall, graceful trees like palms lean into the wind, and the perfume of the flowers is so sweet it makes you dizzy. There are flowers everywhere. They say that no matter how far you get from land on Genlis, you can always smell the flowers. The air is soft and yet fresh. And when the wind blows against your face or body, you feel your skin tingle with delight. Nothing could be more beautiful than Genlis, but there aren't many people on that world, and after I'd been there a few days, I'd felt lonely. I was glad to get back to the ship. So perhaps it wasn't your kind of beauty, said the artist. He was punching crescents with his thumbnail in his putty lump, which of the worlds you visited seemed to you the most interesting? Oh, Cruor, I think. It's a long way from its primary, and there's nothing on its surface but snow and ice. The snow is very soft for some reason, and when the wind blows, there's a great deal of wind. 
It carves the snow into caves and grottos and long pointed arches that collapse if you stamp your foot. The nights on Cruor are very bright. There's an ionizing layer in the atmosphere that gives the sky a constant glow like a night with a full moon on Earth. When the snow arches and caves sparkle in the glow like a million diamonds, it's a fine sight. Then the green sun comes up and the surface of the snow caves melts a little and turns to ice. You should see the sparkle then. It almost blinds you. Usually it snows again before night. Cruor is a most interesting place. You say it was interesting, but you seem to have thought it was beautiful, the artist commented. He had shaped his lump of play putty into the torso of a tiny woman, round breasts, dimpled belly, long, full thighs. Now, which of the worlds you visited seemed to you the most appealing? I mean, gave you most nearly the sensation that I gather you're looking for? There was a long pause. The body of the miniature woman the artist had shaped sank slowly back into the play putty as the resilient stuff resumed its natural globular shape. I've liked a lot of places, Pendleton said at last. There was a world called Flegra that was nothing but volcanoes and geysers. The planet's magnetic field was funny, and sometimes an eruption from one of the geysers would just go on up. Hours later, you might be hit in the back of the neck by an icy spray. But I suppose that's not what you meant? No, the artist said. His eyes swept Pendleton's face. The older man's gray cheeks colored faintly. He rubbed his forehead with one hand. Well, there was Asterope, he said. I don't know what I liked about it, actually. It was a quite ordinary world. But there was a great deal of electrical activity on the planet, and there'd be a dozen thunderstorms in twenty-four hours. Once I was out in one of them at night. I took cover in a sort of hollow in a cliff and watched the lightning. There'd be a great flash, and the sky would turn blue-black. The sky on Asterope was very dark, with almost no stars and the leaves of a funny little tree with white leaves would blaze out in the flash like the stars that were missing in the sky. Then it would be dark again until the next flash. Asterope wasn't an appealing world like Flegra, but during that storm I liked it. I almost felt at home there. Um, ah, uh, said the artist. He had put down his lump of play putty and was drawing something on a piece of paper with a brush. When Pendleton tried to see what the picture was, the artist covered it quickly with one hand. You said something about Earth. Have you spent much time here? No, I was nearly thirty when I came here for the first time. That's unusual. Were you born on one of the colonial planets? No, I was born in a spaceship, and I'd never set foot on anything larger than an asteroid until I was nineteen. Go on, please. This is the sort of background stuff I've got to have. Um, well, my mother died when I was two. Of course, I don't remember her. I suppose she must have been the sort of person my father was. I don't imagine she wanted a child very much. The artist crumpled up the sketch he had made. Go on, Mr. Pendleton. What was your father like? He, well, I haven't thought about him in years. He was a sort of fanatic. He wasn't unkind to me, actually, but he was a strict disciplinarian and reserved and remote. What was he a fanatic about? Pendleton laughed. As I said, I hadn't thought of him in years. Why, he had a theory that the culture of the whole solar system was derived from Ceres, the planet of Aldebaran, originally, and he went from asteroid to asteroid looking for evidence to prove it. I understand that historians consider the theory quite preposterous, 
but father had a private income large enough to let him indulge his whims. As I said, he spent his time searching asteroids. How did he die? The artist asked softly. Pendleton gave a sort of start. He glanced sharply at the artist, but the younger man was looking down at another sketch he had begun to brush. I can't imagine why you want to know that, he observed. It was on an asteroid. Father thought that the Syrian colonists had landed originally on the planet that later broke up to form the asteroid belt, and that by the time they got around to settling on Earth and Mars, their home culture had become too diluted to look much like that of Ceres anymore. What he was hunting for on the asteroids was an artifact of unmistakable Zerian origin. This asteroid was less than a kilo across, and only very roughly round. I don't suppose it even has a number in the asteroid catalogue. Most of its surface was rough and irregular, but in the middle of all the bumps there was a very smooth, shallow pit, made, I suppose, by a fusing meteor impact. Father was looking over this pit with one of the hand lights, and I was inside the ship working on an astrogational problem he'd set me. I was just seventeen. Suddenly, through the ship's speaker, I heard him give a great cry. Son! Son! he called. I found it! Come and see! He only called me son when he was pleased. I climbed into my suit and ran out. He was almost too excited to be able to talk. I found it! He kept saying over and over, while the hand light shook in his hand. I found it, the proof, an Adan. What's an Adan? asked the artist. It's an ellipse with a cross in the middle, but the long arm of the cross is another very flattened ellipse. It looks something like a drawing of a toy gyroscope. It's a characteristically Zerian element of design. I looked down where the hand light was bobbing. At first glance, there did seem to be an ellipse in one side of the pit, but when you looked closer, you saw that it was just a bunch of fortuitous cracks. The inner ellipse was missing. There was nothing there but a collection of feathery lines. It was unmistakable once you noticed it. I hesitated. I didn't know how he'd take my doubting his discovery. Father, look again, I said. Check it. You want to be absolutely sure. I am sure, he answered. And Adan, real proof. See, there's the outer ellipse, and there's the inner... The confidence in his voice died away as he tried to trace out the shape. I he said. I can't stand it. It's been so long. He gave me a terrible look. The light fell out of his hand. Then he clutched at his chest and keeled over. He'd had a heart attack. I got him back in the ship and did what I could for him. I couldn't think of much to do. I held ammonia under his nose and so on, but he died. He was dead within ten minutes after he keeled over outside. He was still glaring at me when he died. What happened after that? asked the artist. I had a public guardian appointed for me. Most of father's income stopped with his death. I went to school for a year. Then I got a berth as third officer on a tramp freighter. Father had insisted that I learn astrogation thoroughly, and I didn't have any trouble getting it. I've been in space ever since. When father was alive and I was with him, I used to think that when I was grown up, I'd go straight to the most beautiful spot in the universe and stay there, the place that was home. I hated the ship and the asteroids. I never thought I'd have trouble finding the place. No, you haven't found it, the artist agreed. He folded the sketch he had made and put it in the breast pocket of his tunic. I've got an idea for a world for you, he said. 
I'm not going to tell you what it is, because I'm pretty sure you'll say it won't work, and I'd like to try whether it will. One thing, it won't be an expensive world to make. Do you want me to try? How much? asked Pendleton. The artist named a sum. It wasn't, Pendleton supposed, much according to his standards. Pendleton hesitated, but after all, what else could he do? He wasn't a young man anymore, and the world, the real world, he was hunting for, might not exist. All right, he said. When will it be done? Oh, today's Monday. Um, let's say a week from today, at about the same time, right? It looks like an outsize egg, Pendleton said. The artist laughed. That's only the sheathing, and an ovoid is the most economical solid for it. After you're in, you'll lose all sense of the shape. Have you ever been in an artificial world before? No. Well, for it to be fully successful, there has to be some cooperation from you. After you enter, pierce the shell of the egg, there's a period of preparation and acclimatization that's partly physical and partly psychological. There's a gas in the air, for example, but I don't want to give away trade secrets. Abandon yourself. Don't resist. And don't try to hurry things. It takes a little time. The preparation will come to an end eventually, and then you'll be in your world. Suppose I don't like it, or after I've been in it a while, decide I've had enough. How do I get out? The same way I got in? No. The artist handed him a metal circlet. Put this on your wrist. After you've had enough of the world I've set up for you, press the stud in the middle of the wristband. That will initiate the reverse acclimatization. A sort of decompression period. It's nothing abrupt, like going through a door. If I like the world, can I visit it again? Of course. Sometimes I leave worlds set up for months, even for years. All you have to do is pay me a small rental fee. Do people ever live in them? The artist frowned. Now you're getting into something. He fished the lump of play putty out of his tunic pocket and began squeezing it. You see, what we artists make are worlds that seem absolutely real, and yet, of course, they are artificial. They're artistic creations, and like other artistic creations, they seem at times to have a life of their own. In this trade of mine, you hear stories. Stories about people who've got into worlds and stayed there, somehow, after the power sources were cut and the world was dismantled. Permanent worlds, some people call them. They're just stories. I don't believe them myself. I don't know anyone who does believe them. And yet, it might be possible. I just don't know. Pendleton had withdrawn his attention when he heard the note of negation in the artist's voice. He studied the enormous bulging golden bulk, the big end of the egg, that lay before him. I hadn't realized it would be so big, he said. Your worlds must take a great deal of room. The artist laughed. They do. That's why I have my workshop out here, miles and miles from anywhere. But, Mr. Pendleton, I think you're stalling. You're hopeful, but you're nervous about your world, too. Go ahead, enter it. How? Just walk up and push on the sheathing. It's made to give at any accessible place. And remember what I said about not trying to hurry the acclimatization period. Pendleton swallowed. He was more excited than he had thought he would be. His knees felt uncertain and weak. His mouth was very dry. He swallowed again. Then he walked resolutely toward the golden sheathing of his world. It gave, on a minimum of pressure, a puff of air, salty and yet somehow smelling disagreeably of violets, went past his face. Pendleton had time to wonder irritably why the artist hadn't simply provided his world with a door 
instead of electing this fantastic sort of ingress. Then he stepped inside. It wasn't so absolutely dark as he had thought it would be, though he couldn't see any trace of the break in the sheathing through which he had come. There was a mist, salt and violet smelling, but quite dry, around him, a dirty sepia mist that moved in eddies of black and charcoal, and he had the dim impression that somewhere to the right was a little hill. He took a step forward uncertainly, there was a blaze of orange-colored pain behind his eyeballs, and the tincture of light died away entirely, leaving him in a blackness that was hard to breathe. Ahead, behind, a bell rang with a high, mocking note. A train of rhomboids hobbled past him in the darkness at eye level. They were brightly colored, reds and yellows, and lit like paper lanterns from within. Pendleton was suddenly furiously angry. He put up one hand to stop the swarming rhomboids and received a paralyzing shock in the palm of his hand for his pains. He put his hand down, swearing. What was it the artist had told him? To relax, to take it easy, to cooperate. But perhaps his getting angry had been a part of the cooperation. It was difficult to say. Something hard, long, and thin slipped into his still tingling hand and was withdrawn again. He looked down. The rest of his body was invisible, but his two feet, such big feet, were to be seen dimly glowing with their own blue light. He wanted to laugh. He wanted to sit down. He was tired. But his body was too stiff to bend. And besides, his dim blue feet were too far off for him ever to be able to reach them. A string of luminous blue and purple circles, much paler than the rhomboids had been, came down at him from above. He regarded them passively, and after a moment or two they hauled themselves up again. The darkness seemed blacker than ever after they had gone, and when he looked down at his feet, they had disappeared into the general night. An irritable impatience invaded him. How much longer was this foolishness going to continue? Nobody named Pendleton, and there was a man named that, ought to have put up with it. Cooperation, relaxation, would mean sitting down and letting himself rest. And all the time he wasn't walking, but his legs were carrying him on. The darkness was withdrawn gradually, as if someone were pulling a curtain to one side. Pendleton drew a deep breath and rubbed one hand over his face. His sense of personal identity had come back to him, and with it the stirrings of curiosity. Where would he be? Would it be in his own world? He stood on a plain, wide, bleak, sulfur-smelling, before a cliff with a dark opening. Far off to his left there was a liquid quaking, a dark stirring against the drab plain, and he knew the flicker of motion must be from a lava pool. It did not interest him greatly, but the dark opening drew him. He wanted to go in. He had no light. Or, why, yes, there was a hand torch strapped to his belt. He hadn't noticed it before. He drew the torch from its fastening, flicked the switch, and for a moment sent the beam of light up and down the dun-colored surface of the low cliff. Nothing. He stepped inside the dark hole. He almost cried out in surprise. He didn't know what he had been expecting exactly, some grand cavern perhaps, with sheeted stalactites and answering stalagmites, Cascades of intricate frozen stone tracery in translucent amber and mauve, rivers, vaulted ceilings, and in the end an underground sea. What he was standing inside a hollow, perfectly polished and spherical, of black basalt. The jet's surface reflected the light of his torch dizzily. At the side of the bubble of stone was another opening. He went through it and stood in another basalt sphere, a little smaller than the one before. Down low in its side there was another hole. 
The third bubble was larger, so large that the beam of the torch was remote over his head. The next bubble was smaller, and so was the one after that. Pendleton went from bubble to bubble, not bored, not unhappy, not thinking, in a relaxed mindlessness that was not quite a trance. Sometimes the exits were so low and narrow he had to crawl to get through them. Sometimes they were ample and commodious. There was always another bubble to succeed the one in which he stood. It came to him that the artist had spoken truly when he called this a world. It would be possible for Pendleton to go on from sphere to sphere throughout the rest of his life, and he would never come to the end of them. The artist had made him a world. Pendleton neither liked nor disliked the fact. The bubbles were alike. Large or small, they were alike. Polished and black and perfect and pierced by two openings. But in the sixtieth bubble, or it might have been the two hundredth or the thousandth lacking one, the beam of his torch picked up an irregularity on the black, lens-smooth surface. He leaned forward to look, wholly incredulous. And it was. It was. There had been incised, in grayish lines against the polished blackness, an Adan. An Adan. For a moment a deep emotion stirred in him. He drew back from it, afraid, unable to name it. It was as if a great depth of water parted and showed him something undreamed of at the quick. He stood transfixed, leaning against the curving basalt, unable to move. Then the emotion was gone, and though he sent the light of the torch over the symbol again and again, it didn't come back. After a little, he sighed and went into the next sphere. Its surface was unmarked, mirror-smooth, as that of all the others but one had been. Pendleton couldn't have told how many bubbles later it was that he stopped, admitting finally that the coldness in his heart had grown into despair. He could, of course, go back through the bubbles to the one with the Adan, and beyond it to the hole in the dun-colored cliff where he had come in. He could walk over the plain to the lava pool. There might be other things on the plain, interesting things besides the lava pool. He didn't want to. There was nothing here for him. His fingers had already pressed the stud. The decompression period was quite different from what that of the acclimatization had been. The basalt bubble around him seemed to fracture into a thousand jagged pieces, each glinting with the reflection of the torch he held in his hand. The pieces began to recede from each other with increasing velocity, faster and faster, as if blown outward by some explosion of which he was the center. He felt that filaments of himself were being blown out with them. When the pieces were very far away, they softened and melted into a grayish haze. Pendleton stood motionless in the haze for what seemed a very long time. Doubt as to who the man called Pendleton was assailed him. He did not recognize his thoughts. The haze brightened to a silvery pearl gray as if a light were shining behind it. Pendleton felt an instant of desperate giddiness. Then it passed and he was himself again. He was standing outside the egg. The shell was intact. How he had got in and out without breaking it was no odder than anything else had been. But Pendleton's mouth drew into angry lines as he realized what had happened. But what had made the artist shape such a world for him? How could he possibly have thought that an endless series of black basalt bubbles was what Pendleton was looking for? He glanced around him. The artist was nowhere to be seen. Pendleton must have been in the world for a long time, for the sky over it had grown quite dark, and floodlights had been turned on down at the end. No, the world had been a ridiculous failure. All that money, all that time, all that hope. Wasted. A ridiculous fiasco. 
he'd find the artist and have it out with him. With long, angry strides, he started toward the shack where the studio was. The surface of his mind was seething with anger, but there was bitter, almost unendurable disappointment in his heart. The studio was empty. On one of the big drawing tables, an envelope was propped up. Pendleton's name had been brushed in large, flowing characters on it. He tore the envelope open. The note read, Dear Mr. Pendleton, You have been in your world for so long that I am beginning to hope that I have succeeded in making what you want. The cave element, of course, came from what you told me about the snow caves on Cruor, and the Adan and the polished sides of the bubbles from the pit on the asteroid where your father met his death. I deliberately disregarded what you said about Asterope, except for the glitter in the lava pools. It seemed to me that it was too conscious to be of much help in constructing a suitable world for you. I hope my choice of construction elements was wise. If you read this before midnight, won't you please call me at Zen Dorf 0329? I am anxious to know how you came out. Sincerely, Bird. Pendleton grimaced. It was an explanation. The artist had, he supposed, done his best. He was still angry. He called the number Bird had given him. A party was going on. He got Bird after a little delay. The artist peered at him sharply in the viewing plate. He whistled. It wasn't an unqualified success, he observed. Judging from your face. It wasn't a success at all, Pendleton replied grimly. What kept you so long, then? Bird asked. People usually come out right away when a world's not right. Pendleton had been placed on the defensive. He didn't like it. The succession of bubbles had a, a hypnotic effect, he answered. But it wasn't at all what I was looking for. No part of it? the artist asked. He sounded rather deflated. Not even the Adan, for example? Pendleton's lips set in a thin line. None of it, he said. Oh. Bird was frowning. I thought I might be able to develop, but I guess not. He cleared his throat. Well, Mr. Pendleton, I don't think there's any point in our wasting any more of each other's time, he said. I'd like you, though, to get in touch with another artist, a man named Selim Zweig. He doesn't do much constructing, and he's difficult to work with. But I think he can make what you want, if anybody can. Have you got the name, Selim Zweig? Yes, answered Pendleton. He started to hang up. Something in his face seemed to alarm Bird. Wait, he cried. Don't do anything foolish. Let me come and talk to you. I... But Pendleton had already broken the connection. No, he wasn't going to do anything foolish, he thought, as he walked down the grassy lane toward his copter. He wasn't, for instance, going to get in touch with the Salim Zweig Bird had suggested to him. There was a disgust that was as bitter as gall in his mouth. He was done with fantastic artificial worlds and the men who created them. Tomorrow he'd make arrangements to leave Earth. There were still plenty of real worlds, starside, that he hadn't visited. Tomorrow he was going to ship out. They took his application at the hiring hall next day. His references, his experience, were splendid, they assured him. They sent him in to the doctor for the usual physical examination, and Pendleton did not pass. He was stunned. For half a day, he couldn't believe it. Starside was gone. He'd never ship out again. He was stuck on Earth. He'd never find the world he had been hunting for so long. It was too late. He passed two days in misery so acute that it made him want to groan aloud. Then, it was inevitable, 
he called Selim Zweig. Zweig was a little man, as ugly and restless as a monkey, and Pendleton disliked him on sight. Nonetheless, it was easier to talk to him than it had been to Bird. He didn't like him, but he trusted him. He told him much the same things he had told Bird. The details were a little fuller, that was all. Zweig listened, cracking his knuckles and nodding peremptorily from time to time. When Pendleton had finished, Zweig scratched his head and grinned. "'Sure, I can make you a world,' he said. "'Won't cost much. Won't take long to make. Sure.' Pendleton felt a thrill that was not all hope, though he didn't know what the second emotion in it was. "'But will it be right?' he asked anxiously. "'Will it be what I've been looking for, a place where I'll feel at home?' Mm "'Mm-hmm. You bet. Sure will.' Pendleton gave him a searching look, but the artist kept on grinning. There wasn't anything else Pendleton could do. Um, "'Go ahead and make it,' he said. Zweig called on the third day to say that the world was ready. His workshop was even more remote than birds, and yet it seemed to Pendleton that he got there almost before he wanted to. He walked across the field to the workshop, with long steps that were eager and yet a little hesitant. Now that the realization of his dream was so near, he was unsure. "'That's it,' Zweig said, pointing. He indicated a big, grayish sheet of something that looked like wrapping paper and was stretched across an arch in the area behind his studio. "'There's nothing behind it,' Pendleton objected after a moment. "'Oh, yes, there is.' Bird used an egg. Well, I don't, Zweig answered. He grimaced and scratched himself on the chest. An egg's a purely mechanical limitation, and besides, that's it. Still Pendleton hung back. Oh, for God's sake, Zweig said irritably. Go on in. The acclimatization's all been taken care of. Go in. Pendleton walked forward and pushed against the sheet. He fell through. That was the only way he could have described it. He fell through. He fell for quite some little time and ended with a cushioned thump on what seemed to be a rubber pad. The impact of his fall seemed momentarily to have shaken the wits out of him. He didn't know who he was. No, that was all right. He was Bruce Pendleton or where, or why. He felt around on the rubber pad with his fingers blankly, as if he expected contact with it to resolve his difficulties. Then he got to his feet. He was at one end of a long, tall, metal-lined corridor. It was lit at intervals by inset golden fluorescence, and the air in it seemed to vibrate to a low, constant hum, almost too deep to be heard. The locale was hauntingly familiar, and after a second, Pendleton realized what it was. He was on a ship, and the ship must be in space, since the low, constant hum could come only from its anti-grav. A ship, certainly, but a ship for giants. The proportions of the corridor, length, height, even the size of the fluorescence, were quite unlike what Pendleton was used to. Only people of enormous stature could pilot such a ship. He pressed his hands over his eyes and tried to think. There was something about a man, a little ugly man like a monkey, who'd made something. He couldn't capture the thought, and after a second, he didn't think it mattered. But he understood about the ship. It wasn't that it was unusually large, it was just that he himself, Bruce, wasn't very tall. Halfway down the corridor, there was a direct contact viewing plate set in the ship's wall. Bruce Pendleton stopped in front of it. He did that whenever he went along the corridor, because he loved to look out at the stars. It was like looking out of a cave into paradise. How beautiful they were against the intense velvety darkness of space 
They burned. They seemed to glitter and flash with a blinding sparkle, more bravely than a billion diamonds would have done. He knew that was illusion. Stars in space don't glitter. They burn with a steady light, but they did seem to blaze out at him. And each one was a sun, an unimaginable furnace, and around each sun were its unimaginable worlds. One of them, Pendleton knew, was more beautiful than all the others, and that one was his own world. It would take time. He had to wait. But sooner or later, he was going there. At the end of the corridor, a door was set flush in the metal sheathing. Bruce hesitated in front of it. His right hand ran over his left wrist uneasily. It seemed to him there ought to be something on his wrist. Not the little chronometer, but something else. A metal circlet with a... with a... But he couldn't think what it was, and he'd better not spend any more time puzzling over it. He had dawdled enough in the corridor. He rapped on the door, as he'd been taught, and waited until he heard the deep voice saying, Come in. Then he opened it. The desk was piled high with books and papers, but the big man's face lay in shadow. There was a pool of shadow around him on the floor. Well, son, he said without turning, have you memorized your astrogation tables thoroughly? I've just finished a most interesting book about the Adan in Mayan culture, and I can spare you a few minutes. Do you want to recite the tables to me now, or would you rather wait until tomorrow morning? I don't want to hear them unless you know them thoroughly. The lines of anger and unhappiness had faded from around Pendleton's mouth. His face had become young and timid and hopeful, a forward-looking, eager face. "'Well, sir,' he said doubtfully to the man who was his father, "'I thought I knew them pretty well, but maybe I'd better wait until tomorrow before I try to say them for you, sir. Yes.'